On World News Tonight, Smog Alert. India's capital fights air pollution as the government attempts to induce artificial rain. Crisis control. The IMF answer Pakistan's prayers with the second tranche of the $3 billion bailout package. Flight of fantasy. Flying taxis take centre stage at the Dubai Air Show, promising a future of air mobility. And Latin Grammys. Latin music legends and rising stars come together to celebrate the 24th annual Latin Grammy from Seville, Spain. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News. Our final broadcast of the week starts us off with some hopeful news for the debt-ridden Pakistan. Pakistan met targets set by the International Monetary Fund for the next payout under a $3 billion bailout package, boosting confidence in the economy months before the nation holds elections. Pakistan and the International Monetary Fund have reached a preliminary deal for the release of $700 million from a $3 billion bailout package after two weeks of talks with the global lender. The IMF said that it reached a staff-level agreement with Pakistan's caretaker government on the first review of the $3 billion fund. IMF Pakistan Mission Chief Nathan Porter said in a statement that upon approval, around $700 million will become available, bringing total disimbursements under the program to almost $1.9 billion. The $700 million fund is the second tranche of the bailout the IMF signed with Pakistan in June this year. The next month, the cash-strapped country on the verge of default received the first tranche of $1.2 billion and was asked by IMF to take a series of steps, including revising its budget and ending electricity and fuel subsidies. After its two-week review of Pakistan's economic situation that ended this week, the IMF in its statement said that a nascent recovery was underway, buoyed by international partners' support and signs of improved confidence. The statement added that inflation, which in May hit 38%, the highest in four decades, and is currently hovering at about 30%, is expected to decline over the coming months amid receding supply constraints and modest demand. But the global lender cautioned the country's economy was not out of the woods yet. Pakistan, home to 241 million people, has been facing financial and political instability for nearly two years. Its central bank's foreign reserves depleted to less than $4 billion, leaving just enough money for less than a month of imports. It owes more than $20 billion in external debt in the current fiscal year. Meanwhile, the Pakistani rupee has lost more than 50% of its value against the dollar in a year. Some analysts, however, say prudent policy decisions by the Pakistani government have improved macroeconomic fundamentals such as inflation, which dropped to 27% in October. Lahore-based economist Hina Shahik told local media that the government has taken bold steps in accordance with the IMF requirements to significantly increase energy prices. With national elections scheduled in February, Shahik said the announcement of the vote also adds some stability to the political situation. Meanwhile, poor air quality has prompted India's capital, New Delhi, to issue a ban on construction in the hope of keeping down the dust and reducing vehicle exhaust. These day laborers in New Delhi would normally be at work. Instead, they're out of a job as the government looks for solutions to the toxic smog gripping India's capital. To combat the problem, the city has banned all construction, sent students home from school, and is blocking non-essential trucks from entering. On Thursday, New Delhi held top spot as the world's most polluted city, according to Swiss group IQ Air, which categorized the air quality as hazardous. A thick layer of toxic smog is a yearly occurrence in the city, despite government pledges to fix the problem. The ban on construction has compounded the misery for thousands of workers. We have to keep doing something to feed ourselves and our children, said this man, adding that he's the sole provider for his family. Part of the issue is wind gusts, carrying smoke over the city from farm fires and nearby fields, said a meteorological department official. The Supreme Court ordered a ban on crop residue burning, but local media reports said farmers are defying the order. These are anti-smog guns being deployed in an attempt to settle dust by sprinkling water across the city. 
A scientist leading a trial to seed clouds to produce rain, the plans have been rescheduled due to unfavorable weather conditions. Every winter, air quality worsens in northern India. Cold air traps emissions from multiple sources, including vehicles, industries, construction dust, and agricultural waste burning. At the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum in San Francisco, U.S. President Joe Biden said his face-to-face -face meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping emphasized the two countries' commitment to cooperate in areas where they both stood to benefit. At a summit of Pacific nations in San Francisco on Thursday, U.S. President Joe Biden said his face-to-face -face meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping emphasized the two countries' commitment to cooperate in areas where they both stood to benefit. We're going to continue our commitment to diplomacy, to avoid surprises, to prevent misunderstandings. A stable relationship between the world's two largest economies is not merely good for the two economies, but for the world. A stable relationship. It's good for everyone. But despite agreements in some areas, Washington and Beijing are far from eye to eye on significant points of tension. Robert Ross is a professor of political science at Boston College. Well, we agreed to reopen military dialogue, but we have yet agreed to a meeting, so that could be pretty far out there. And once we have a meeting, we don't know whether it will be substantial. We agreed to um, cooperate on fentanyl, but nonetheless, most of our fentanyl comes from Mexico, and even precursors are beginning to be developed outside of China. So going forward, I'm not sure we've really accomplished very much in terms of either helping the American national interest or alleviating U.S.-China tensions. Biden and Xi met Wednesday ahead of the APEC summit. At a dinner Wednesday night, Xi told American executives that China is ready to be a partner and friend of the United States and that there was plenty of room for bilateral cooperation. But the pleasantries may mask the real depths of a rivalry, where Washington and Beijing compete on trade, on technology, and diplomatically for global influence. So I would expect going forward, we'll see more of these meetings, simply because both sides want to portray an image of cooperation, even as the president says very clearly, we're going to continue to compete. Washington had tried to win over 14 other nations, excluding China, to join a trade deal. But that effort collapsed this week. Let's move on now to election updates on the road to the White House. Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s allied super PAC says it's willing to spend millions of dollars on a 30-minute infomercial that will be all about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The idea outlined by the American Values 2024 PAC at an event in Midtown Manhattan this week is unorthodox. Officials said that they are planning to debut the video early next year at red carpet premieres in New York and Los Angeles to highlight Kennedy's celebrity support on the coasts. The plan underscores how Kennedy's political team is putting his celebrity at the center of his bid, even while presenting the candidate, a scion of democratic aristocracy, as the anti-establishment heterodoxical option in the race. Panelists at the event pitched Kennedy, a first-time candidate, as a danger to the 1%, a fighter for every child born and unborn, and someone who would close the border if elected. A 30-minute infomercial is not unheard of in presidential politics. Then-candidate Barack Obama aired one at the tail end of his 2008 run for the White House, using his well-stuffed coffers to fund a massive TV onslaught in the campaign's closing days. Over in Australia now, a day after severe weather hit Queensland, heatwave conditions and thunderstorms are again set to test the state's emergency services. Queenslanders know only too well the power of a late spring storm. Today marks 15 years to the day since a devastating cell ripped through the gap, leaving nothing but carnage in its wake. Conditions are ripe once more. Just yesterday, an isolated system tore this property to pieces near Kilcoy and dumped blankets of hail around Gympie. Stifling heat and humidity means we could see more ferocious storms as soon as tonight. It could pack quite a punch 
with damaging winds, that's wind gusts in excess of 90 kilometres an hour, large hailstones and heavy rainfall possible. Most of the state is right now subject to a heat wave warning. As temperatures soared past 41 degrees in Mount Isa, a few degrees cooler than scorching Longreach, the hottest in the state, the North Queensland Cowboys in town for their season review, looking for ways to cool off. Jumping these bars here at the Saltbush Retreat, so let's test it out. Longreach has already reached 44.4 degrees so far today, which is about 8 degrees above the November average. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Israeli forces say they found an entrance to a Hamas tunnel at the Al-Shifa hospital and a body of a hostage near the site, backing their claims that Hamas is using the hospital as cover. This comes as they advance into the next phase of the ground invasion. The Israel Defense Forces has said that it has found the body of an Israeli hostage in a tunnel shaft at the Al-Shifa hospital complex in Gaza City. According to the IDF on Thursday local time, the Israeli military discovered the body of Yudit Weiss in a structure near Al-Shifa hospital. The body of Yudit, may her soul rest in peace, was recovered by our forces, the 7th Brigade, which was scanning the area by the Al-Shifa hospital, we recovered her body in one of the homes during the scanning. Near her body, we found bodies of terrorists who were holding Yudit. The 65-year-old woman was kidnapped by Hamas militants during the raid on southern Israel on October 7, when at least 1,200 people were killed and more than 200 were abducted. Her husband was also killed in the Hamas attack. The IDF also said that it had uncovered an entrance to a Hamas tunnel at the hospital, revealing videos and photographs of the tunnel shaft and weapons. It also said that a Hamas pickup truck similar to those used in the October 7 attacks was discovered carrying weapons near the tunnel entrance. This comes after Israeli troops raided the hospital Wednesday morning, searching the buildings and interrogating some people there. They say that Hamas has a military command center underneath the hospital. Israel's defense minister also supported this claim, saying the IDF's recent findings signal that there is significant underground infrastructure in the area. I arrived today at the headquarters of the division whose special forces also operate inside Al-Shifa hospital. There are significant findings there. The operation continues and it is done in a precise, selective but very, very determined manner. He did not specify what the significant findings were. The defense minister added that the IDF has taken control of the western part of Gaza City and that the army has now moved on to the next phase of its ground operation. Next in Spain, the Socialist Party leader Pedro Sanchez won a parliamentary vote, giving him a second term as the country's prime minister. Spain's Conservative Popular Party won the most seats in the general election, but was unable to form a majority coalition. A proposed amnesty bill for separatists in Spain that sparked weeks of protests across that country has now helped Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez secure another term in office. This was the moment that Parliament voted to keep Sanchez as the country's leader after he secured a political alliance between his Socialist Party and backers from smaller regional parties. The amnesty deal was part of those negotiations. If it becomes law, it could clear up to 1,400 activists and politicians who've tried to have the Catalonia region secede from Spain, peaking in 2017. Catalonia is the region that holds Barcelona. The bill's drawn protests and condemnation from conservative groups in Spain. The night before the parliament vote, the leader of the far-right Vox party, Santiago Abascal, was seen at one protest. He's saying the Spanish government is attacking the constitution and separation of powers and compares it to a coup. It's not yet clear when the bill would be brought to Parliament for a vote or when it would take effect if it's approved. The European Commission will continue the use of the controversial chemical herbicide glyphosate in the European Union for 10 more years after the 27 member countries again fail to find a common position for or against a prolongation. It's the most widely used pesticide in the world and Europe 
stopped the anger of environmental campaigners. EU approval of controversial weed killer glyphosate was set to expire at the end of this year. With member states in deadlock over whether to extend its use, the decision fell to the EU's executive arm. It renewed the approval for a shorter period of one decade, with new conditions attached. These restrictions include a prohibition of pre-harvest use as a desiccant and the need for certain measures to protect non-target organisms. In 2015, the World Health Organization's Cancer Research Agency found that glyphosate was probably carcinogenic to humans. But others disagree, such as the US Environmental Protection Agency and the European Chemicals Agency. And the agro-industry sector says there are no viable alternatives. The Greens' political group of the EU Parliament called for the Commission to go back on its decision. We should not gamble with our biodiversity and public health like this. EU member states are responsible for authorising the use of products individually within their national markets. French President Emmanuel Macron had committed to ban glyphosate before 2021, but has since backpedalled. Flying taxis have been a sci-fi fixture for decades, but now they are finally close to reality. First in the United States and then the United Arab Emirates and India. A number of companies presented their flying taxis at the Dubai Air Show, which they say will soon be carrying passengers in locations across the world. Flying taxis from cult science fiction films like Blade Runner or The Fifth Element are set to become a reality, taking over the Dubai Air Show this week. Archer Aviation's flying taxis' first flights in the UAE are expected in 2026, while US approval could be as soon as 2025. What we are used to think of as science fiction is now science fact. This is happening, it is real, and you will see this in the market in 2025. While the aircraft resembles a futuristic helicopter, there are key differences around sound and emissions. We have designed this around this business case to operate in urban environments, say from the airports to city centre. It is eco-friendly. It has about 100 times less the noise signature of a conventional helicopter, so it's very neighbour-friendly as well. Archer's Midnight wasn't the only flying taxi on display at this year's air show. Uh, what you see behind us, which is the uh, manned version, or electrical air taxi as some refer to it, uh, is planned to be certified and then further exported. As a third step, we would then uh, move to the European and then US markets. The use of flying taxis has been publicised as an option for the 2024 Paris Olympic Games. But this week it received backlash from members of the Conseil de Paris and the Deputy Mayor of the capital. France's Ministry of Transport is set to make a decision at the beginning of 2024. Welcome back. A Moldovan dog has bit the Austrian president. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. A large fire consumed a warehouse in the centre of Mexico's capital, Mexico City, sending a giant black plume of smoke into the sky. Rescue workers renewed efforts to reach 40 men trapped for a fifth day inside a collapsed highway tunnel in India. Rap and hip hop superstar Diddy, whose real name is Sean Combs, has been accused of physical and sexual abuse as well as sexual slavery and rape. Tyson Fury and Alexander Reyes will fight today for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world in Saudi Arabia. Moldovan President Maya Sandu's dog overturned protocol by biting visiting Austrian President Alexander van der Bellen on the hand. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again next week as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with the highlights of the 2023 Latin Grammys in Seville, Spain. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend. <laughs>